Hello, Munich. <laughs> Um, I'm Philip from Wikitude. I'm really glad to be here and I'm honored to talk about one aspect of uh, AR Cloud, making your own micro AR Cloud. So we'll talk a little bit about what I think was probably the most hyped topic in the AR industry, but for that a little bit more afterwards. Let me start in a way differently um, with this. For me per personally and also for the company, Wikitude, very iconic device, the T-Mobile G1 the very first public Android device out in the market. If you look very close, and the screens are really huge, so you can look close, you will see an app icon that kind of resembles a palm tree. And that was 2008, 2009, the very first application icon of the Wikidude app. Um, so soon, we're going to celebrate 10 years of Wikidude. And back then, this idea of presenting travel information to consumers in an AR manner was quite innovative. Uh, it brought us quite far in the first Android Developer Challenge. And now, 10 years later, fast forward, um, Wikidude became one of the leading AR development platforms in the market. Still independent, still kind of driving the topics that we want uh, to drive. Over the past six years, we have been serving more than 100,000, actually a little bit more already uh, in the market, and more than 25,000, 30,000 uh, applications somehow include um, Wikidu technology, which estimates go reach more than 1 billion devices out there. So over the past six years, we've built an SDK for you that enables you to create applications, to in, uh, enables you to realize AR use cases uh, for you. And what I kind of want to prove with this slide here is not how awesome Wikitude is. I mean, I, of course, it is awesome, but um, in a way, show you the how heterogeneous, how different our client base is at the moment. At the total, we kind of have 3,500 commercial licenses out. And this reaches from various retail companies to producing and manufacturing companies to marketing campaigns. For me, this proves actually one point. It proves that AR is not a feature in itself. It is not a use case. It is a tool that will power many, many different use cases. And it's a tool that will help a lot of industries solve their problem, problems in a very different way. Of course, we can do this not alone in the market, and I kind of want to tell you a little bit of the philosophy that we see and that kind of how that philosophy that goes into our product. And there are kind of three cornerstones to the Wikidu product. One is we strongly believe in cross-platform. We think the technology should run on all the relevant platforms, Android, iOS, uh, Windows, if you take mobile AR. Um, because in a way, on behalf of your users, you don't care which device they have, or at least I think you shouldn't. Secondly, we think, as I said before, AR is an integrative part, an integrative part to your use case. Like Wolfgang Schelzer yesterday said, AR is not the solution to your problem. I think you already have solved a certain problem. You have solved or you provide a solution for a certain use case. And hopefully, AR will help you to solve this in a different way, ideally in a more efficient way, in a more meaningful way, in a faster way. But it still is the use case that you have been trying to solve, and AR will hopefully make that better. And in that respect, we think AR technology needs to be an integrative part in your solution, and not a silo somewhere out there built in Unity that kind of lives outside your business logic and business uh, uh, IT infrastructure. I think it needs to be a part in your existing offering. And that's how the SDK has been designed, that it, you can integrate it into your solution. Thirdly, as I think we're quite, still quite early in the market, AR is to be looked at from a holistic perspective. Um, if you work with us, you will see that we pack quite a lot of different solutions into the SDK that you can try out and you can find out on your own what actually helps me most and you can discover that on your own. Kind of coming to the main topic of today, AR Cloud and kind of micro AR Clouds. To kind of get to the point of micro AR Clouds, I kind of want to introduce and what we mean with AR Cloud and kind of what it is. And if you dwell into this topic of AR Cloud, you sooner or later will meet a company called 60 AI. And if you're lucky, you will meet the founder and CEO, Matt Misnix, 
who roughly a year ago mentioned or said this sentence, there's no point building an AR, AR app unless it interacts with the physical world in some way. And he said that and mentioned that also in reaction of ARKit 1, the very first release, where uh, the, the demos that we saw were not interacting with the real world at all. They were entirely disconnected with the real world. Of course, uh, ARKit can map and can track in the real world, but there was just no relation to real world. And personally, I couldn't agree more uh, with this sentence, because I think the magic word here is context. And context is this not-so-secret ingredient that differentiates and distinguishes VR from AR, that differentiates AR from a universal mobile application. Making use of the context of the user that he currently is in is one of the challenges that we have to face. Think of booking.com. You can book a hotel or a flight uh, on your mobile, regardless where you are. It doesn't really matter which context you personally are in. Successful AR experiences, I think, will always make use of contextual information with the promise of delivering more relevant information and more relevant experiences. For me, making use of contextual information is one of the biggest paradigm shifts for our industry, and I think one of the biggest challenges this AR industry will face still to provide meaningful experiences. AR Cloud kind of gives us also this promise that we can work with very precise location data, and out of this we can derive a little bit more meaningful context. Of course, we have been working with GPS, we have been working with other location providers, but all, they have, all of them have some sort of problem with that, right? GPS is just too inaccurate to create a really immersive application. And this comes from a guy uh, of a company that actually started with GPS and sensor-based AR. And if, you've been have, if you have been here already yesterday, you might have seen the Gartner hype cycle uh, on emerging new technologies and augmented reality at this throth of disillusionment, very lonely there. Um, but if we look into the hype cycle of the hype topic AR and kind of create an own hype cycle, I think we all agree that AR Cloud was just, just over the peak of uh, this uh, in peak of inflated expectations. There are many other technologies that kind of we could map and uh, we could see that some of those technologies within AR have been already used and are kind of moving to the plateau of productivity and are, we see them embraced in more than proof of concepts in kind of commercial applications. But I think AR Cloud itself, we're facing this kind of next step that we'll try We'll more and more try it out and see what actually it's useful or not useful. I think the AR cloud discussion couldn't have come without the advent of Pokemon Go. And in a way, Pokemon Go is a pretty good role model for AR cloud. Why do I say that? It's globally available. It has persistent contents. You can find Pikachu everywhere. Um, it has an idea of an AR feature, not as essential to the game as we might want it to have. And it has social aspects and real-time collaboration baked into it. If you look at the kind of more formal definition that is made up by us, AR Cloud is a localization service that works indoor and outdoor globally based on visual information with high precision and allows to share AR experiences with other users in real time across any AR device. So if we take out the, more, the most important parts, localization service, and you also can see that PowerPoint seems to render stuff very differently on my laptop and on the presentation screen. Um, so the highlighted word here is location, localization service. It's a localization service based on, no, not based on globally, that allows us to share AR with high precision. That's the keyword here. And we can share that um, in real time across any AR device. Oh, the last one worked. Framing that differently, what are the kind of the promises and the benefits we get from an AR cloud service? Precise localization, as I said before, in a very, very different accuracy compared to GPS. A visual uh, localization service promises centimeter or sub-centimeter accuracy, while average 
errors in GPS in the outdoor field are somewhere between one, two, three, four meters. The promise of the ability to store content persistently, it enables collaboration based on top of that, plus you can sync and share content again on that. And those are all capabilities that are essential to an AR cloud offering. But as we want to see, not only just to an AR cloud offering, those capabilities, if they are baked in into applications and use cases, are actually quite useful for every other use case out there. And when you talk about AR cloud, quite often uh, you have to kind of this notion of a 3D reconstructed outdoor scenery like uh, this uh, still image here from a promotion video from Blue Vision Labs uh, from San Francisco here, or kind of a visual map of San Francisco. That's kind of the dominating notion of AR Cloud. You have a global spanning network or digital copy of um, the surrounding that people can use. As I, as I said before, the four capabilities that are based on AR, that AR Cloud kind of promises, uh, promises us can be used in a lot more different use cases. Some of them we mapped here, um, multiplayer game that you play at home with someone else, a collaborative remote AR meeting that you, again, have in your office somewhere at home. Factories, manufacturing processes that benefit from a very precise localization. What they all have in common is that they kind of run in private mode or in a private surrounding. Um, and would require data and visual data that I hardly would upload to Google, Facebook. One, probably of privacy concerns um, in an enterprise environment. I probably do, do, don't want to visually map my factory uh, out of obvious reasons. So we coined this term micro AR clouds, which is really just kind of a helper tool for us to um, package or package those benefits that you can get from the functionality. For us, a micro AR cloud is a room or floor level representation for high precision localization that can be distributed and managed by the creators directly. So again, we have high precision visual localization, um, but the difference here is that you actually own the data that you map. The spatial data that you use that is used to trigger that um, high precise localization is owned by you, is managed by you, and you can update and work with that on your own. It stays where you are. It's not a service that uh, we, we offer for you. It's something that you can create on your own and work with, uh, work with for your use cases. The title of the presentation is that it's called Making Your AR Cloud. So I'm kind of need to tell you also how you can make it. And there are two essential parts that you can start actually already today to make your own AR cloud, uh, micro AR cloud um, as of today. For the topic precise localization, the Wikidu tooling allows you to create a visual representation of any room, floor, or scenery that you like um, that enables centimeter accuracy and registration of multiple users. It also enables you that you establish a common coordinate system for your users that register in that, and you will see what I mean with that uh, afterwards. You can include different versions of the scene. Um, that becomes helpful if you're capturing a room, if you capture objects that look very, very differently, either over the course of daytime, over different seasons, um, objects that you put in different backgrounds. Um, so the former kind of understands that and builds a map that kind of represents different versions of the very same object so that recognition quality is increased. Those maps can also be extended and grow over time. By that, we kind of bring a higher reliability um, to the map. It also kind of has the effect that you can detect stable and static items versus dynamic items that are not useful for recognition and regularization. And the key question for many is how can I get this scene representation, this map that I can use afterwards. And while some others might require you to buy quite expensive and costly hardware, we thought, we thought this process needs to be as scalable as possible, in a way as easy as possible, not requiring a recording app, not requiring any, any dedicated hardware, 
So we came up with the solution that what you need to create those spatial representations are just images, regular photos you take with whatever you have, smartphone, doesn't matter. You upload those images, different versions of the object, different versions of the scenery, and the software in the background then creates kind of a re 3D representation of that and then extracts the relevant information that makes it possible to run on a mobile phone. And what you can see here on the right-hand side is uh, one of those upload processes, just regular images taken on a Samsung phone um, that uh, then create this re visual representation. The file format or the file, this spatial information that is generated afterwards, we share that with you. We give that to you. You can host it on your own server. You can host it in your own infrastructure. You can package that with the app bundle. That doesn't really matter. It's your data. You can work with that. It lives on your server. It's up to you to uh, use that. The second part is how do we persistently store content? And then immediately kind of the question comes, how do I actually create content? And Wikidude's solution right from the beginning has been that you can create content with a JavaScript API. And that has several advantages that become come handy in here in this aspect. One is the experience itself consists of regular HTML files, regular JavaScript files, regular CSS files. They, in a way, even look like a mobile website extended by the functionality that is in our uh, library with some particular JavaScript objects that you can add that you actually then render in AR. But the experience itself actually is in JavaScript. So regular files that can live again on a web server, your web server, you can distribute them, you can update them out of the App Store. It doesn't really matter. The second benefit is it works cross-platform. The rendering, the execution of the experience looks very looks similar on iOS, looks similar on Android, looks similar on Windows. And as I said, you can include your own business logic like you do currently with mobile websites or mobile version of, of, your, um, of your use case and your service. You can include that or use that as it is now. You can use the same business logic. You can update objects. You can query your database. It really doesn't matter. It's a part of your infrastructure, of your solution. Um, that then nicely hooks into that. That combined are what we call micro clouds. And here are two examples, or three examples actually, how then kind of the spatial representation or the spatial looks like. This is from a public data set. Uh, it's a castle that is, the in yard of the castle is about 30 by 50 meter. Um, that's one of kind of the objects that we, we uh, we created. On the left-hand side, you see a 3D reconstruction just for visualization purposes. On the right-hand side, you see then actually the tracking data or the spatial data that you will get packaged nicely and you can use for your own application. This was from a development tool. This here is then from a tool that you would use. This is a metro station in Cologne that I mapped for demo purposes. I took 20 images of this hallway. And on the right-hand side, you can, can see the visual representation there. I think you can easily spot the posters um, on the wall. You also can see kind of the, the arc of, of this pathway. Um, would a little bit look better in an animated uh, environment. But that's kind of the tools you get and you can work with, and you can place AR content then to that. Second or third example here is a church portal. Again, about, I, I used about 20 photos kind of depends on the level of detail you want to uh, include in the map, how much you want to have close information or information far beyond. But what you can clearly see is already kind of this, the details that you see on the door, also in the visual representation, that is only used for tracking purposes that you then can use uh, to place content items there. And kind of how this then looks in, in, in practical, I would like to show you a video, uh, roughly two minutes video, that shows three use cases. The first one is based on our JavaScript API. Um, as a sync and collaboration uh, layer, we used WebRTC uh, that we included for demo purposes. The second example in the video is based on Unity. Again, spatial representation used as a common uh, coordinate system as kind of a micro AR cloud. Um, the collaborative part, the sharing the data there was uh, based on Unity's network layer. Uh, we kind of 
totally fine how we do that. Okay, so uh, let's have a look. So you might have wondered why I didn't talk about the third use case. Um, that was actually fake. For the first two, we actually built demos that we then recorded. The third one was just made up. Um, if you want to still see how object and object tracking works, I invite you to the booth where we show a toy truck, a moving toy truck, where you then can uh, recognize and track that also in real time. I think a pretty interesting demo. So if you have questions, I think we'll use Slido uh, next for some questions. Um, I reached the end of my presentation and would like, th would like to thank you for coming here and uh, talking about AI Cloud. I'll be around a little bit more. We have a booth if you have more questions or we start with Slido. Thanks a lot. All right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> And we go. We got like two questions here at this moment. You, you up for it? Sure. All right. The first one: Can I create a micro AI cloud with Unity and without any JavaScript know-how? The, the simple answer is yes. Um, the same technology stack is in, available in Unity. That's in general our kind of approach that we try to uh, have as many different input possibilities for you to work with. If you're familiar and fine with Unity, use Unity. If you're familiar and fine with JavaScript, you can do that as well. So yes. All right. Next one. So the generated 3D feature clouds are used for the localization. So as markers? Uh, in a way, they're kind of markers. It's something pre-known. It's something that you can use uh, to recognize and localize. Um, but of course, you can uh, kind of use them in a broader uh, aspect as well. OK. That's an easy one for you. Yeah. You gotta just go through it. <laughs> and here's the last one. Is it possible to track the devices in real time, for example, shoot at another, at another person? I guess at another gamer player or something. Um, that's what we've shown kind of in, in, in the second uh, demo. Um, yes. So um, if both users have the same map data available, again, you can distribute it as you like. It's just a matter of how you distribute that data. Um, and that, as I said, we used WebRTC, which works in a local environment close to real time. Unity has a pretty good networking stack included. It also works in nearly real time. Uh, so all in all, yes, you can do that. And you can update information in the states as you like. We don't force you to a certain, you know, how you do that, um, how you exchange game objects, and how you exchange game data or any other sensing data. So it's entirely up to you. Yep. All right. So that's for the questions. Cool. Thank you so much, Philip. Thanks a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, Philip Nagler.